Uh, for many of you, this may be your first occasion to be here at our new building, and uh, welcome. Uh, this is a, a, a new phase in CSIS, and as we move into our 51st, 52nd years, um, and uh, people here are very excited about this change, and uh, I think uh, it gives us all sorts of new opportunities to, to engage with our friends like yourselves, and so thank you for being here. The second point is congratulations uh, to the editors and the authors to this volume that we're ta here to talk about today, Non-Communicable Diseases in the Developing World, Addressing Gaps in Global Policy and Research, and I hope you've had a chance to, to at least acquire a copy. Uh, maybe you haven't had a chance to read through and digest it. Uh, uh, I think as we'll hear in the course of the presentations and the conversation today, this is a really important piece of work. Um, uh, important, uh, if only because it has asked some of the most fundamental questions about uh, what is it that needs to happen in operationalizing a strategy on NCDs uh, in low-income and lower-middle-income countries. What should the priority focal areas be, and how do we get there? And there are four or five key themes that I'm not going to preempt. Our speakers will hit on those today, uh, both Lou and Jeff, um, on, on, on where the analysis carries us. But I think uh, uh, Lou and Jeff and the authors uh, in the volume, I think you all deserve enormous credit for helping us think this through. Um, it doesn't surprise me. Uh, Jeff has been an, a, an academic uh, in his origins uh, and, a, and a medical and health uh, uh, academic uh, before having a, a very distinguished career with Merck uh, and then um, uh, a career in Global Health Council and, and, and now with Raven Martin. And, and this, is, uh, this is in your genes, man. Uh, this sort of uh, thinking and analysis, convening, getting people focused around thinking hard and putting words on paper in a clear and very intelligible and forceful way. And so congratulations. And of course, uh, partnering with Lou Galambos uh, from Johns Hopkins University, and this has been his life in, in producing the, these kinds of very uh, 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 forward-looking uh, and visionary uh, analyses. He's a professor of history at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he co-directs the Institute for Applied Economics, Global Health, and Study of Business Enterprise. Um, and so um, we are gathered here really today to, uh, to hear from the two of them and then to have a broader conversation. And we've been very fortunate in having Sally Cowell join us, uh, who's the Senior Vice President for Global Health at the American Cancer Society, uh, familiar to many of you for the decade of her work at PSI, and before that, all of the different work that she did stretching back to as a dip, career diplomat, as a deputy director at UNAIDS, as a key personality on matters pertaining to Cuba, and on and on and on. And um, uh, Trevor Gunn, uh, who's the managing director, uh, managing director on international relations at Medtronic, also a good friend, uh, also a person who brings enormous sort of intellectual weight. Uh, he's an adjunct professor at Georgetown, a PhD from the London School, uh, a trade expert, a, a, a public health expert, and, and, a, and a geopolitical strategist. Um, so we have quite a combination of backgrounds and expertise to come to this conversation here today. And what we're going to do is ask Lou to kick us off uh, today uh, with some opening uh, eight to ten minutes of, 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 of uh, presentation around what does this mean and where do we look forward from here. Um, and then we're going to turn to Jeff uh, to offer some additional remarks around uh, the volume and where it points us. And then we'll turn to open things to a conversation, and we'll have Sally and, um, and Trevor uh, help us kick that off. And then we're going to turn it to you and, and, and ask you to join that conversation, and we'll try and get to that point fairly rapidly. So without any further ado, I would like Lou to open us up uh, this afternoon. Welcome, Lou. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot. It's good to be here. It's a beautiful day. Um, frequently, you get a lot of bad news in, in the newspapers. I still read a newspaper, uh, two of them. And uh, uh, so I have some good news for you to start out with. 
uh, and that is that the biggest major in undergraduates at Johns Hopkins University is now public health. Mm -hmm. I have 126 students in a course on the history of global public health since World War II. And it's a joy to teach them. A lot of them have direct experience. They, they, they've done internships, and so it's a marvelous experience. Uh, great enthusiasm. So I'm really happy to be here, and, and Jeff and the other contributors want to thank Steve and his team and in this beautiful place. Wow, uh, I'm, I'm blown away. Uh, so it's a nice place to be. Uh, but uh, some of the news is not good. Uh, as most of you know, non-communicable diseases, which is our subject matter, which includes cardiovascular disease, diabetes, asthma, chronic respiratory infections and cancers uh, are the leading causes of disease worldwide. Uh, an estimated 36 million people, this is a stunning number, um, die from such diseases each year. And what is less commonly known, um, uh, and certainly among my students, is that 80% of these fatalities occur in low and middle income countries. So it's not distributed evenly over the world. And these statistics are stark, uh, and they hide, I think, um, the, the human toll and what this does to societies. Uh, in 2010, cancer alone killed 8 million people. And the picture is similar for other NCDs. One in four deaths globally from heart disease or stroke, 1.3 million deaths from diabetes. Current trends continue, there'll be a 17% increase, 17% increase in the NCD burden over the next decade. Africa, for instance, and by that, I think my main reference is to Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, see the gro see, we'll see a growth of more than 25%. The absolute number of deaths will be greatest in the Western Pacific and Southeast Asia regions. The good news is that, that many of these fatalities are, are preventable, both through programs that aim at reducing high-risk behaviors, tobacco use, alcohol abuse, poor diet, sedentary lifestyles, styles, and, and at creating better environments. Uh, progress can be made there through improved treatment and service delivery for patients who need now chronic care. Cost-effective interventions to reduce the burden of these diseases exist, and sustained action can prevent millions of premature deaths. M most of the medications that are needed uh, are now off patent and, and can be used in generic form, uh, which makes a tremendous difference uh, in terms of cost, as you know. A global movement for action on NCDs has been gathering momentum in recent years. Now, largely because the efforts of people like you in this room uh, who have an interest in the issue and are looking ahead. The, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution on the prevention and control of NCDs in 2010. It's, it's very interesting in teaching a history course to watch a series of movements develop and to watch how it gathers force and, and the number of people and institutions around it. And it, there's a, usually a great surge and then a turn in the movement. So it, it, it's wonderful to watch. And, and one of the things I like to teach is that, that uh, some of it has elements of contingency and leadership still matters. Everybody thinks of the great environmental forces that shape all of this. And, and they are important. Uh, you know, there are economic and political factors. But also leadership shapes this. And we try to bring out some of the leaders when we do this. This is a global movement, though. In September 2011, the UN convened a high-level meeting that you know about that led to the adoption of a political declaration that laid out a clear plan for global surveillance, monitoring, and, and, and the things that would help that, and a health system response to prevent and control NCDs. In May just of last year, the 65th World Health Assembly set the first voluntary global target for a 25% reduction in premature mortality from NCDs, and the target there is 2025. Last month, the World Health Organization issued a draft terms of reference 
for the UN Interagency Task Force uh, on Task Force uh, on the Prevention and Control of Noncommunicable Diseases. I want to get the title right. And this week in Geneva, right now, uh, the WHO has convened a member state consultation on a proposed global coordinating mechanism to support work on the global NCD movement. As we'll talk about this afternoon, there are clear roles uh, in, for civil society and the private sector to work together with the public sector in answering this call to action. In 1978, 1978, and you had Alma Ata, and you had a call for action, but it did not include the private sector. You couldn't do that at that time. In 2000, you could, and today you can, and today you have to. And so uh, I think multi-sectorality is a very important subject. Uh, so there's a clear roles, I think, defined for the private as well as the public sector. Uh, policymakers need to decide uh, how best to incorporate NCD responses into existing funding streams, money matters, and programs. The path forward on NCDs is and will always be contested. There will be debates, critiques, They'll continue to pour out while healthcare workers will continue to implement and refine a set of rather ambitious, measurable, time bound, achievable targets and metrics on NCDs. The global monitoring framework will provide accountability if governments and their partners implement and support independent mechanisms to track progress and build capacity for coordinated multi sectoral actions at country regional, and global levels to fulfill the commitments that have been made in 2011. These actions should develop along four related lines. First, there will be efforts to achieve better integration with other health system priorities. Second, this will be accompanied by new efforts for implementation of best buys. That is, we do have to pay attention to cost all of the time the proven cost-effective interventions that can help prevent NCDs uh, or to treat those that are most prevalent. Third, integration and implementation will require attention to innovation. This has been for the last 40 years my major subject of interest, which is innovation uh, in, in the public, private, uh, and, and in the nonprofit sector and the way they work together when it, when it works. And so um, this is an extremely important uh, potential uh, uh, for, for development uh, in the future. Things like polypills, uh, comorbidities, the things we can do uh, that, that bring things together and make it better, make, make, make better use of our resources. A new multi-sectoral partnership will address this. Fourth, as always in healthcare, there will be a search for additional investment there will be a search for money so that adequate resources are available to meet these NCD challenges. This was the context in which Johns Hopkins Institute for Applied Economics, Global Health, and the Study of Business Enterprise, uh, and in this we were led by Jeff, um, no doubt. Uh, Jeff is a, a, a formidable leader in this regard, and, and uh, he helped us get the Institute involved to make actionable recommendations. That was our goal, to come up with something. We, we all had a general picture of what to do and sort of uh, what needed to be done. We wanted to translate that into actionable recommendations. The members of the NCD working group included Sir George Elaine, uh, Robert Black, Johns Hopkins, Felicia Knoll uh, at Harvard Global Equity Initiative, Margaret Crook, Mailman School, uh, Sonia Nash Nishtar, uh, Hartfile Pakistan, Richard Lang, who helped us, Sorin, uh, Soren Matke at the RAND Corporation, um, Kenji Shibuya, Shibuya at um, Tokyo University, and Brian Whitegay at the University of Montreal. Also Prashant Yadav at the University of Michigan. Uh, Jeff and I were also part of this working group. We built on the 2011 RAND report on improving, ac improving access to medicines for non-communicable diseases in the developing world, the working group decided very quickly to focus on these five specific areas. These were accelerating 
regulatory harmonization, an important subject. She has tremendous political um, uh, aspects. Structuring supply chains uh, more effectively, improving access to interventions, restructuring primary care, and promoting multi-sectoral action. And that brought out the book. That's what the book is focused on, uh, which Jeff and I co-edited with Rachel Calvin Whitehead. It's the product of a kind of collaborative dialogue among the members of the working group. It identifies what needs to be done and offers a framework for how to approach this work. Now I'll turn over to Jeff, who's going to provide you an overview of the book's recommendation. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Lou. So I'll just take another couple of minutes to walk us through um, in a little bit more detail what the recommendations are from this, uh, uh, this collaboration that Lou talked about. Um, and also, um, uh, I'll be surprised if you don't um, tell us uh, when you have a chance to intervene later that we've missed something that's really important. And I, uh, you know, as I said, uh, I won't be surprised because we aren't, we aren't uh, suggesting that these five areas are the only things that need to be done. These are five pragmatic recommendations for things that can be done now uh, to really move this agenda forward. Uh, so the first, um, as Lou mentioned, Brian Whitegay uh, from the University of Montreal has a chapter that talks about regulatory reform. Uh, and you know, when we think about access to, uh, to health technologies, particularly access to medicines and vaccines, um, there's, it's fair to say that a lot of attention focuses on how affordable they are in, uh, in lower and middle income countries. Uh, but the reason that regulatory review is so important is if the medicines aren't available in those countries, there's not much you can do, whatever the price is. Um, and uh, as, uh, you know, as we know from experience, for instance, with uh, getting HIV medicines into Africa over the last 10 or 15 years, um, because Africa has 54 different regulatory bodies, um, it often is a challenge to make sure that a given antiretroviral is available to everybody who might need it across the continent. Uh, so that's why regulatory reform is, is so important. And, the, this comes under two headings. Lou mentioned regu regional harmonization, which is one uh, possibility, and there are many initiatives along these lines, and the chapter provides much more detail on this. Uh, but the idea there is that, um, you know, if you're a small country like Togo, it may not be necessary for you to have uh, as rigorous a review in Togo uh, as you might if you were South Africa or the United States, for that matter. Uh, and that there are, um, uh, through the regional economic groupings like SADC and, um, and COMESA and the others, uh, there are initiatives now that the African Union is also uh, trying to bring together in a, uh, in a harmonized way uh, so that a country like Togo can really depend on review, uh, the technical review that's done elsewhere, uh, and then just make sure that that's consistent with their own regulatory and legal framework. Uh, but it would be a much more efficient way of ensuring that medicines can get to more people um, rather than having 54 reviews. There might be a, a harmonized review on a regional basis. Um, and this applies as well in Asia and, and Latin America. Um, the other point is, is capacity building. And that, you know, uh, obviously this audience uh, thinks about capacity building in many ways. But here uh, the chapter really focuses on the possibility of uh, stringent regulatory agencies working with, like the FDA and the European Medicines uh, Agency, the Japanese uh, uh, FDA, working together with uh, agencies in lower and middle income countries uh, so that they can help build the level of skill in the national medical uh, regulatory agencies uh, so that they'll be able to do uh, a better job uh, on a range of things, not just the technical review of dossiers, uh, but also, for instance, um, building laboratory capacities so that they can deal with questions of uh, counterfeit and substandard medicines, uh, which is a, a big problem that uh, regulatory agencies in these countries face. The second area is, uh, has to do with supply chains, and this is where Lisa Smith and Prashant Yadav from the University of Michigan uh, have contributed a really interesting chapter. Uh, and what they do is step back from this question and really look at the structural obstacles that uh, impede access to medicines and other medical supplies uh, to people in developing countries. And they look at this from the manufacturer all the way to the, the patient. Um, and the, the critical issues here are the fragmentation of supply, uh, because in many countries there are just so many, um, uh, you know, uncoordinated ways that medicines uh, are, uh, are imported and then made available. Uh, that often uh, you just don't, you have poor economies of scale, poor coverage, uh, and uh, leakage from the supply chain, 
Uh, and so uh, it just doesn't, uh, isn't the most efficient way to ensure that people get the, uh, the commodities that they need. So they look at a variety of ways of solving this problem, for instance, accredited healthcare retail networks, uh, and also wider use of differential pricing in a more systematic way. And uh, so that's uh, an important area. Uh, the next area that we focused on was uh, what can we learn from the HIV epidemic that can be applied to, uh, to NCDs? Um, and this is where Soren Matke from the RAND Corporation had, uh, had some interesting ideas. And he focuses on really two key issues. One is the importance of partnerships so that uh, companies who are involved in helping to uh, deal with NCDs um, can, you know, not only can they bring novel products to the market, and I'll, that's the second point, so I'll get to that in a moment, uh, but they can work together with other players in, um, in the healthcare systems uh, to set up partnerships that will take advantage of skills that companies have uh, uh, and bring them together with community and, and government uh, uh, stakeholders to try to do a better job of creating programs that, for instance, will train uh, community health care workers to help uh, complement what doctors and nurses can do. Uh, they can think about ways of applying um, uh, methods for improving adherence to therapy, which will uh, help improve health outcomes. Uh, and you know, a number of other examples that, uh, that Soren gives. The other uh, example, um, uh, actually Lou alluded to in passing, is, uh, it has to do with product innovation. Uh, and there, I think there are some interesting opportunities for work on, on what are known as polypills, where you know, there are so many comorbidities in NCDs. People with diabetes will have high blood pressure. People with uh, elevated cholesterol uh, you know, will, uh, you know, may have, also have high blood pressure. So, uh, so there actually are some uh, initiatives already in looking at ways that you can formulate uh, some of these medicines into one pill that will treat many conditions at once or several conditions at once. Uh, so that's another area. Um, the fourth has to do with primary care, and um, you know this is uh, well. If, you know, people often say I love all my children, uh, so you know I love all the chapters in the book, but this is probably the chapter that I, I like the most. Um, uh, Margaret Crook and uh, uh, Gustavo Nagenda and Felicia Knoll uh, have written a really uh, interesting uh, overview of the way in which reconfiguring primary care can actually help us get more health for the money that's invested uh, in, in health systems in lower and middle income countries. Uh, and they look at, uh, just as Lou talked about four eyes of integration, implementation, innovation, and investment, uh, they also look at four eyes. Uh, some of them are the same, integrating primary care across, uh, you know, for instance, um, you know, this audience knows well the work that PEPFAR has done to build a platform that has really made it possible uh, to um, much more efficiently treat people not just with HIV and AIDS, but also uh, to bring other uh, interventions in, say, on maternal and, and child health. And also, I think there's an opportunity to do this in, uh, in NCDs as well. Um, so they look at ways that you can integrate across the primary care platform to deal with uh, a range of different conditions. They look at innovations in service delivery, for instance, how you can use uh, community health workers to, uh, for task shifting. Uh, they look at the importance of including communities and the voice of the patient in de designing the programs that are going to provide improved primary care, and I think that's a really important point. And then the fourth is to look at the ways in which new information technologies can help uh, uh, extend the reach of primary care, and, and so they give some examples in uh, Latin America and Asia and, uh, and Africa where M Health initiatives have actually done a good job of doing that. Um, and then finally, uh, well, there are actually, there are two other chapters. One uh, by Sir George Elaine and Sonia Nishtar looks at the importance of multi-sectoral and intersectoral collaboration. Um, one of the things, uh, they actually make a distinction between those two. Often they're used interchangeably. Uh, but what they say, uh, first of all, they observe that the political declaration uh, mentions at least 15 times the notion of multi-sectoral partnership. Um, and it's interesting, I, just one aside is that um, the political declaration may have said that, but it's interesting to me that uh, when the WHO convened this um, member state consultation this week on the global coordinating mechanism, the first thing they did was decide that they didn't want anybody but member states sitting in the room. So that's, uh, uh, but we can come back to that. The, um, uh, but what Sonia and, and uh, Sir George do is make a distinction between multi-sectoral and intersectoral. Multi-sectoral would be a whole of government. This is the easiest way to, to talk about it. So that um, you know you want to have uh, not just the health ministries involved, but education and agriculture and sport and transport and communications, because you know all of those um, those ministries, uh, all of those sectors have something to contribute to health solutions. 
Uh, and then they talk about intersectoral cooperation, and here um, the, uh, another way of thinking about that is whole of society. So it's not just the organs of government or, or an interagency approach within government, but you want to work with civil society and the private sector uh, to convene partnerships or to, uh, to create partnerships uh, that can actually help uh, to translate uh, this mandate of the political declaration into practical action. And then finally, um, Stuart Gilmore and Kenji Shibuya from the University of Tokyo take up the same theme as one of the uh, cross-cutting themes throughout the book, uh, and they talk more about the importance of thinking differently about global health governance so that this kind of uh, collaboration and coordination among sectors really becomes uh, part of the DNA of, of work in global health, uh, because that's a way in which uh, we'll really have an opportunity to improve the equity and efficiency and responsiveness of health systems in, uh, in uh, NCDs as well as in other areas. So that, in a pretty big nutshell, are the, this, the set of recommendations that, uh, that we offer. Uh, and we're, uh, as Steve said, you know, we're offering this as a way to try to help focus, um, you know, what's been a very uh, broad-ranging debate over the last couple of years uh, into um, areas of work that will actually move us from better policy, which is important, uh, but to translate that to programmatic action that will really uh, help us reduce the burden of NCDs. So thank you, and I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. So you've focused us into these five areas. Um, you've reminded us that political leadership, Lou, that political leadership is essential. Uh, you've hinted around that there's still quite a bit of residual antagonism and suspicion around the private sector, though the private sector remains absolutely essential to what is going to happen. Um, and you've given us these five key points to think about. So Sally, from the standpoint of the American Cancer Society, from the, your background at PSI and elsewhere, how does this framework look? And what would you argue needs to be, you know, from, from where you sit right now, what needs to be the sort of sharpening of priorities looking forward in low and middle income countries? Well, thanks very much, Steve, and let me join the others in congratulating you and CSIS on this beautiful new building. I'm, I must say for many, um, many a lunch on the basement of K Street, it's awfully nice to be looking out at, at the trees. Um, and, uh, and I must say more importantly, to have the same high quality programming that went on at K Street move over here to Rhode Island Avenue. So. Um, Thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation. I think this is an enormously important book because it's so pragmatic. Um, I've always been a fan of, of not sitting on your hands while wringing them. I mean, I think we, we need to get on with things, and we need to translate lofty ideals down to what can really work on the ground and what can governments do and what should they do. Um, to stop talking and start doing. And I think we know what to do in many cases. And this book um, lays that out very carefully. Uh, I guess the one, uh, I'd, I'd make a couple of additional points. And, and, and it comes out in the book, but to my way of thinking, not quite strongly enough. And you wouldn't be surprised coming from the point of view, I suppose, of the American Cancer Society. But you shouldn't be surprised from any point of view that for me, uh, if you don't do anything else, do something about tobacco. I mean, tobacco is the only risk factor which is common to all four of these large d diseases that we've talked about. And it now accounts for one in six of the NCD deaths are tobacco um, related. Uh, there are 15,000 people a day who are dying, dying from tobacco use and another 1,000 who are dying from the effects of secondhand smoke. So um, tobacco is key. Uh, 600 million people who are alive in the world today, which is almost one-tenth of the world's population of now 7 billion, um, will die from tobacco. And half of them are now children. So uh, way back to the 2011 high-level meeting, and I must say to CSIS's report going into that meeting, said, um, start with tobacco. Um, it's a way to frame things. And it's been talked about, but it should be the lead engine, and I think we're not making enough progress on that. And that should be the framework convention on tobacco control exists. It's been signed by many nations. It's not necessarily being implemented 
Um, even now, all around this town and other town, trade talks are, are going on. The tobacco trade is a key part of that. So um, I'd, I'd like to see some focus on that. Um, as Steve mentions, I have a uh, I come from the AIDS world, really, to the AIDS world, and then to reproductive health, and, and now to non-communicable diseases. And I think from the AIDS epidemic, um, we learned a few things uh, that are key here. And one of them is that money is crucial. Um, you know, money alone isn't enough. But without money, uh, you really won't do very much. And today, the spending on NCDs by um, international donors and by country governments themselves is nowhere near uh, in proportion to the epidemic. So in 2009, uh, the spending by the international, the, the uh, official government money uh, going as donor money to support health programs, about 1% of that was going to NCDs, whereas globally, non-communicable diseases are about 45% of the disease burden, uh, and in some countries, of course, very much higher than 45%. But 45%, and as this book points out, increasing to 75% over the next couple of decades. So the spending is lagging. That was true in the AIDS epidemic, too. I speak from uh, somebody who goes way back in, in that to the, the time when um, priorities were otherwise, and it took real political will and real co political commitment um, on the part of countries themselves and also on the part of donor nations to reverse that. So I think without um, the political will that you saw that led to the establishment of the Global Fund, which turned on the taps for money, we would not have made the progress in attacking the HIV-AIDS epidemic that has obviously been made um, all across the world. So um, I think we need to get the spending up there. I agree, certainly, that multi-sectoral, and I would not call them PPPs, but PPPPs, private, public, people, or patient partnerships. I think it's true in all diseases, but especially for these non-communicable things. I mean, you are your own risk factor in many ways, so we need to involve people. This is not something that can be done to you. It's something that you have to participate in, and certainly um, it's something that uh, writ large, I think, our, indu our industries and businesses, the private sector in healthcare is important at the, at the community level. I know this certainly from my work at PSI, the, the sort of half of the health care in the world to low and middle income countries and to low and middle income populations is in fact de delivered by the private sector. Um, we also know the private sector supplies um, a lot of um, all of the products that we eat and the products that we use in our, in our daily lives. So I think it's important that we involve the private sector um, in this conversation. Uh, and the final thing, and again, this alludes to um, the book when it talks about primary care, I think we, we uh, ought to remember that really uh, non-communicable diseases are a game changer in terms of the agenda on women's health that we have been pursuing for the last four decades. Um, all of the MDGs are really measured around um, pregnancy, preventing pregnancy, preventing um, mortality from pregnancies, from unsafe abortions, from things concerning women and their reproductive life. Um, and certainly it's important to continue focusing on those things. In, in many countries of the world, the Sahel, for instance, uh, Mali and Niger and other countries um, still have really, really, really high um, uh, births per mother, and no one says that it isn't important to um, ha have people have the number of children that they want to have and have families of a smaller size. But in many countries, it's really cancer and other non-communicable diseases have overtaken pregnancy and HIV as the primary driver of death in women. Uh, the good news about uh, the last 30 years and the the really significant progress we've made in maternal health and in HIV and AIDS is it gives us so many more points to intersect with women throughout their life cycles. 
So we need to be capturing that. We need to be, um, when women come in for antenatal care, we certainly need to be testing them for gestational diabetes, for um, high blood pressure, preeclampsia. When a woman comes to have an IUD inserted, why wouldn't we do a cervical cancer screening? Um, and then, uh, speaking as the only woman on this panel and also of a woman a, a, of a certain age, let me also say we need to talk about women beyond their reproductive years and to be um, continuing to involve women who are um, not only extremely vulnerable, but also in so many cases the supporters of their families and the providers of health care. Um, we need to keep women healthier longer and keep them from dying prematurely. Um, we, know, we know what to do, and there are lots of exciting movements that came out of the high-level meeting, like a Women and NCDs Task Force, um, that I, I hope we will be able to employ to make a real difference on the ground in communities and nations and families. So that would be my comment on this extremely valuable book. Thank you, Sally. Medtronics um, has has been uh, really in a lead position for for some time now in trying to stir discussions and get the alliance supported in the lead up to 2011 and partnering with lots of different institutions around the world to contribute to a greater training capacity, skill levels, understanding, applied research, and the like. Trevor, you've been a very guiding hand in all of this process. Um, how does this, how does this framework look to you? What would you, what would you add to it? How would you sharpen it up from, from your standpoint? Adding is tough to do, um, because it is again adding my congratulations to Sally to the author. Certainly, it's a path-breaking work, and certainly hits directly at the. Uh, one of the fundamental problems is how misunderstood non-communicable disease is and the fact that it, uh, most in the world would probably say it's not relevant to the emerging countries and it hits directly at that theme. And I think that that's exactly where it w ought to be. Perhaps it's more in the, the second category, Steve, of sharpening um, that I'd make some suggestions. Um, certainly I think that we need to get a right definition on multisectorality and intersectorality, however that's called, um, but I certainly want to uh, compliment Sir George's lead, continued leadership. Uh, that chapter in the book is a, is a part of it with his co-author. Um, and, uh, and, and it's correct, as Jeff has said, I think that the private sector feels at times that we're just one big private sector and, and sort of lock us in a closet and don't come out. Um, and maybe when we're screaming, you'll open up the door. Um, and that's not the appropriate framework for the modern society in which we are, that is not uh, what you know, m the, the major leaders of the world had in mind when they put those 15 references. Um, I've heard 17 references, 15 references, but there are a lot of them. Um, and if you look at the MDG um, Eminent Persons Report, Homi Hamras just down the street was the author of that. That's a major report uh, in advance of the MDG goals. NCDs are well mentioned, and the role of the private sector equally critical to the success in those. So we, you know, I always say, spell out the rules of the game, figure out what it is. I realize that there's a part of the private sector that certainly is not welcome, and I probably have the same personal views exactly, uh, consistent with Sally's on what that is. But there are a lot of other parts of the private sector and other or organizations, educational institutions, architectural organizations. Look at, you know, one of the most uh, clarifying moments was when I visited Steve a little bit ago, and John Hammer, the president of this place, stopped, we stopped in the hallway to talk, him, and he, what, he went into this extremely graphic discussion of how this actually building was built and how exactly they got lead standards met. And you know, that's not your normal uh, discussion you have with a CEO of any organization. And uh, you've got to eng engage all these people in this discussion. It's got to be across sectors. We'll have no, we'll have no uh, success if everyone isn't involved. Even if we disagree with each other, we need to be involved and we need to be sitting at the same table. Um, and whatever, whatever we call it, Sally, whether it be PPP, PPPP, or whatever we, we call it, no, I certainly welcome the issue, the, the attitude I think is relatively the same uh, and putting the patient in the middle of it, and I certainly think that that's, that's the right way. Uh, we've, we're starting a new activity over at the Institute of Medicine. I'm proud to be on that 
uh, part of that activity where we are going to be sitting down again in that sort of multi-sectoral way to figure out what is the, the right way forward. And as you look at why PPP, PP, whatever they are, are done or not done, you really come down to this issue of conflict of interest, at, at really at the core, and really kind of Look, the financial services industry went through this, particularly after 2008. It can be done. There are reasonable ways to disclose these issues and disclose your conflicts as we start. I always disclose issues when we go at a conversation where I go between I'm on the ink part of the business and when I cross over to the philanthropy part of the business. My colleagues have shown the leadership that you've seen on the philanthropy part of the business. They deserve the credit, but there's also legal lines and ethical lines that when I go back and forth between those lines, I, you know, very sharply uh, uh, always try to point out. And I do want to, and again, I think, Sal, you said it beautifully, which is that donors need to all participate. You know, Rachel Nugent, a dear colleague of mine, and, and Sir George, Rachel, and I, particularly before the high-level meeting, would have these quarterly coffees, sometimes lunches, really healthy stuff in, di in addition. And we would sit down and try to figure out what are the basic principles that we wanted to adhere to that ultimately, some of which are actually embodied in the, in, in, in the political declaration. Um, and Rachel, who is now um, out at the University of Washington, did, a, I think, a seminal report that deserves rep repetition that talks about 1 to 3 percent of global donors right now in the NCD space. It hasn't changed very much. But the reality is the epidemiology is changing much more quickly to the negative without that action. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, I always look at ourselves in the mirror, and I, I hope as an organization we always do that, and I say, okay, if we call for multisectorality, we call for public, the public sector, if this is a major public health challenge, the public sector also participate, are we actually participating? I think some of us know that we've done a lot of things in, in this area and they're well documented and if, we, you know, we're happy to disclose any of the figures or, or results that we've got behind those. As I think most of you know, we've recently put a, a very major commitment uh, on the street in the past, uh, uh, past two or three weeks that some may know in the room. Um, which amounts to about uh, $16 million over the next uh, five years. Um, that is a philanthropy commitment. We're very interested in local engagements. Um, um, and we're not stopping there. But in a certain sense, we need the public sector truly to participate. Um, uh, it can't be, in a, in a very strange way, I feel at times that we're leading the public sector. That's not a great place. We need the public sector alongside us. Even if we sometimes disagree or have issues, uh, we all need each other uh, in a certain sense. It sounds trite, but, but the reality is that's the modern uh, reality uh, and, and, and what we need going forward for solutions here, Steve. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, offer just a few remarks and um, uh, offer some sort of counter thoughts to these five, some of these five areas and ask our participants to react to some of this, and then we're going to open things up. Um, in, in terms of just a few remarks, the, um, we got through the last decade of expl explosion of commitment and interest around infectious diseases. This decade is still to be defined, right? And we did have the Global Burden of Disease report almost a year ago, which was, to my mind, a, a, a thunderclap. And um, in terms of the, the data, the analysis, the quality, what's happened since then. And, uh, and now we have the, the, the move towards the post-2015 framework, uh, the, 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 the sea change of discussion now around universal health coverage. So we're in a different era, we're in a different decade, it's still to be defined. Work like this helps us to define that. So uh, I think it's important to emphasize that. Now on the five points, on the regulatory authorities piece, I think this is very timely. Um, we have, uh, yesterday we had Peggy Hamburg here from FDA. Uh, Dr. Hamburg has been a leader, joined with Brazil and, and, and many other regulatory authorities in trying to find a way forward of creating uh, much higher levels of cooperation and capacity building across regulatory authorities. So the, the, the timeliness of this suggestion, I think, resonates with what's happening within our own government and many other governments where the regulatory authorities are looking at this. But I think we need to be very humble. The amount of confusion and data around illicit, the illicit marketplace is, 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 is quite staggering. And it is a health security problem. And I think in terms of sharpening the argumentation, 
the resistance that we're seeing emerge across multiple areas and the inability and difficulty of engaging India and China meaningfully into this um, is, is fundamental. So I just put those out as cautionary points, but I think that this, you've, you've identified a very uh, quick evolving issue that is a priority in other places for many of the same reasons. On supply chains, another key area, and I think we need to be fairly realistic, supply chains are a very useful device for supplying cash to political campaigns and to <laughs> offshore accounts. Um, supply chains supply different value for different people, and the health sector has been a honeypot uh, for years in low income and lower middle income countries for supplying value in other directions. And um, one has to ask, how do you turn that around? And where do we see, what does it take to correct that deep-seated set of habits of corruption and diversion, uh, financing of political campaigns, and, and lining of offshore, offshore and inshore accounts? Uh, on the public-private partnership, this is very, the whole private sector issue, I think, um, it's very contested territory, it seems to me. This is the big puzzle that people have to grapple with, which is the antagonisms and suspicions concentrated around the food and beverage industries, the, um, the, the difficulties that pharma has on conflicts of interest and the like, the medical products industry that, 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 um, uh, that Trevor represents is may, perhaps better positioned to navigate some of the some of those tensions and play more of a more of a convening and 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 intellectual leadership. But there are others, many others, obviously within the food and beverage industry who have stepped forward. Perhaps we could hear a bit more about how do you move through this very contested terrain on the prevention and primary care place piece of this. I think uh, only to say I think that there is a sea change underway, and I agree with Jeff. This is, the, this is the sweet spot, I think, for where change is really possible. If people are talking about universal health coverage, they're talking about expanding primary care uh, access and the like. It's the foot in the door. It's a change of outlook and norms and political commitments that point people in that direction, and that's very good. On the integration issue, ag, transport, urban planning and the like, I would, I would say even more powerfully, urbanization, if you look at those places that are facing uh, galloping urbanization, um, that is where this, this poss possibility of integration and the absolute imperative of integration comes into force. And obviously China, China's dialogue with Jim Kim and the World Bank, looking at 150 million people moving into, uh, in the next 15 years, moving into um, the coastal ur urban settings and having to think in a much more multi sectoral way about how do you prepare for this reality because if you don't prepare you're going to have an absolute catastrophe and every government in Africa every low income government fears the 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 fears in a in its own way that urbanization will overwhelm it in its own way if if a peasant agriculture is not preserved if other if other other opportunities are not preserved. So I think there I would, I would make that argument even more powerfully. I think that the framework you've put forward is very, is I think those five organizing concepts are very valid and they point us towards some really tough uh, challenges. Perhaps I could ask Jeff and Lou to offer some thoughts uh, here from, um, uh, from um, Sally and Trevor and then we can open the floor, so thank you. Sure. Well, thanks to you know Sally and Trevor and Steve for those uh, provocative and and um, really interesting comments on uh, that. Just uh, I mean, what they my first reaction is that it just uh, reinforces the conviction I've had for a couple of years now that um, this is such a rich and complex set of issues that it you know we'd better figure it out because the future of global health really depends on on sorting these uh, these issues out in a way that leads to effective action. Um, on just a couple of points I'll make on um, to draw together some of the things that uh, that all three of uh, our commentators uh, said, um, you know I think I'll start where Steve ended with urbanization, and I um, 
you know, it's already the case that uh, more than half the global population lives in cities, and that percentage is going to increase over the next 20 or 30 years. Um, but the cities, you know, I'd venture to say that our, most of us in this room, when we have a mental map of urban centers, we think of places like Washington, D.C., New York, London, Tokyo. Um, but the cities uh, in 2030, 2050, if you just think ahead to where these trends are going, um, you know, we're going to see that most of the top 20 cities in the world in terms of population will be in China. Um, and, you know, it's places like Lagos, not London, that are going to be more like the cities of the future. Um, and so, you know, I think it really makes sense for us to think about how to integrate um, the challenge of dealing with growing urban centers with making sure that, uh, you know, providing for the health of people living in those centers and the surrounding urban areas um, is really addressed in an effective way. Now, that's, uh, you know, that sounds ominous on, on one level, but on the other hand, it really is an opportunity uh, because one thing about cities is that it's easier to reach people in, a, in an urban center than it is to find all the people out in rural areas who live in you know, very small villages, and it just is much more complicated to reach them. Uh, that's one reason why we've seen a lot of attention recently to uh, the last mile, that is getting health resources to uh, people who are far away from urban centers. Uh, but I think it's, um, uh, you know, if you, put, if you apply the Pareto principle, if we come up with solutions that will work in major urban centers, we'll be, really be able to help most of the population. Uh, and then we can uh, also address um, additional ways to, to reach the rest. Uh, so I think that's really uh, an important point. And um, the, other, uh, the other thing I just want to say generally is, uh, you know, all uh, Sally and Trevor and, and Steve have all talked about the importance of partnership and, uh, and collaboration. And I, you know, many of you know that I spent 20 years in the pharmaceutical industry before I went to the Global Health Council, and now I, um, I try to help uh, all kinds of clients solve puzzles they have around global health issues. But, you know, one of the, um, again, I'll use the word conviction, a conviction I have based on that experience is that the problems that we face in global health now are so complicated and so, um, uh, just so uh, challenging to really deal with at scale um, that a solution that focuses only on uh, whether government is going to meet the challenge is unlikely to succeed. Uh, in, in the same way that a solution that focuses only on how the private sector can do it or communities can, you know, find ways to organize themselves and take care of business on their own isn't going to work. I think the only way that we're going to be able to deal with um, this complex set of issues is to find a way to ensure that everybody who has something to contribute is part of the solution. Uh, and we can negotiate all of these, um, uh, you know, uh, difficulties around conflicts of interest, around the skepticism that, uh, that one sector may have about the other, uh, if we just focus on finding something we can agree on to work together to solve, and then use that as the basis for trying different ways of working together, when you succeed with that, that gives you an opportunity to move on to the next thing. Uh, and over time, that just leads to um, uh, you know, more and more confluence of interest and convergence of activity around the big problems that need to have everybody engaged to, uh, to solve. So, so I think that's, those two points, I think, are, uh, are the ones that stuck out to me from, from the discussion. Lou. You my, I will give you my note of, uh, my note of personal uh, in, involvement, and that is um, uh, I believe adherence is an enormous problem that's going to grow. It, it's bad enough in our societies, and it's going to be even more in the, in the lower and middle income countries. And so I see primary care. Primary care is the, the rate controlling um, institutional change, as I see it myself. Um, and that's just a personal observance. Uh, finally, about tobacco, I say that my, my sister died of secondary smoke and my father died of primary smoke. I've often felt that if I'd had a video of my father dying 
it would uh, discourage quite a few smokers. Um, I didn't have that and, and wouldn't do that, but uh, it, is a, it is a crucial issue. So uh, I'm really happy to see these, these kinds of suggestions bubbling up because that's what we want to do. So thank you. Trevor and then Sally, and then we're going to come to our audience here. Trevor? Right, and I want to never said they had a problem hearing me, uh, but uh, there we go. Um, for those that are remote, regulatory harmonization, I think, Jeff, you called it out or someone else called it out. I think that really has to, I mean, all barriers, some of which are tremendously are artificial to access, governments need to do their work, the private sector needs to do their, their piece when it comes to this, and this is where the regulatory harmonization piece, I, you know, kind of bothers me a bit. Because if I look at the WHO map, which I, I have great respect for the work that they do, and I'll be into WHO medical devices forum next weekend in Geneva presenting on trade agreements. Um, but what I would say is, I, as, I, as I look at their map of countries that are regulated for medical devices, it looks like all the countries are regulated for medical devices. But the reality is only about 65 are actually regulated for medical devices that have any real competency. And I'm talking countries like Chile, who just decided a very advanced country who just decided to regulate medical devices, and, and, and it's still in draft form. Um, and so I, it, it, I do see as well uh, donors uh, such as, you know, colleagues that are doing great work over at the World Bank under a Gates-funded uh, uh, project uh, that are working in East Africa, uh, but that uh, regulatory harmonization is only confined to drugs. Um, whereas I think the real mystery to solve is actually for devices that are not easily. So we need to break down some of those artificial barriers and see what can be done in that particular area. Obviously, tariffs, we have something called the information technology agreement uh, negotiations that are occurring as we speak in Geneva. It's another area that uh, governments can, uh, we can help, uh, but there's limits to what we can tell the government. And, and uh, you know, we have to say that tariffs are a good sense of source of revenue as well for those governments. But at the same time, uh, they actually do prevent um, access to uh, to technology to other services that actually may um, be able to bring uh, uh, s slow the pace of some of the trends we've talked about. Sally, just one very quick comment, and that's um, I, uh, for all that I said, we need more investment by governments. I don't think there will be another a global fund created for NCD. So I think that most of that investment is going to have to come. Um, from the private and public sectors in the countries around the world. And I think that effective advocacy and, and getting people involved in advocating for, for better or for worse, most countries in the world now are democracies, and they are at least somewhat responsive to the public will of their societies. And so I think we need to energize people in these countries to encourage their governments to invest. And governments have to think that um, the prevention and treatment of NCDs early on is really an investment and not a cost. Um, you know, there's a difference between a health care system and a sick care system. And governments, I think, would be smart to get on with that as soon as possible and to encourage the private sector and cities which are walkable and preventing obesity and, and uh, doing something effective about tobacco. But invest, um, invest early and often, just like Mayor Daly said about voting, I guess. Okay, why don't we, um, we've got a number of folks. We'll take uh, comments and questions. We'll bundle together several. There's some hands in the back, so we'll start on the back side there. Lois, okay. and, uh, and then we have uh, three or four. We'll please be brief. Please identify yourself. Yes, sir. Uh, please be brief. We'll do four or five, uh, and we'll start with those in and around you, Lois. So you okay. kick us off. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Lois Pace. I'm with the Livestrong Foundation. Very much appreciate um, Ambassador Koala's final comment around there not being new money. So Livestrong Foundation, as people know, has been on the Hill, has a meeting with the administration, and what we continue to hear is how can we do more with less. And so I'm wondering, Jeff, you talked about there being an integration chapter. Are there specific case studies therein that explain how people can actually be doing i.e. addressing NCDs now with the platforms and frameworks that we have, whether that's through maternal child health programs or through PEPFAR. There are only a few examples still. Partners in Health, Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon. I need more in these meetings that I'm having with state, with the White House, and with congressional offices. Thank you. Uh, just in front of you there. 
Hi, Carolyn Pryor from Millennium Challenge Corporation. Nice to see you, Trevor. Um, we had a non-communicable disease program health project in Mongolia that was very successful. And my question, we, we had a nearly $50 million budget, so we were very unique, I think, in the NCD portfolio field right now in terms of what we could do. And our advocacy spanned many different types of advocacy, including even um, a drama series, a soap opera of sorts, of 30 episodes regarding non-communicable diseases. And I was wondering how, what in your experience is the best way to get the people part? The advocacy that's worked um, in your previous experiences, has radio been the solution, TV, public outreach campaigns, what, what works? Because we did so many different things, it's hard to discern what actually worked. It was successful, but we were able to spend so much money. Now, when I'm talking to other donors that are trying to work in this field, it's hard to say, oh, this is, and, and I understand, obviously, there's unique country context to all of this, but it's hard to say, oh, this is a good way to go um, because we, we were able to do so much, fortunately. Thank you. Yes, my name is Michelle Farmer. I'm with Chipaigo. Um, I just have a question. I mean, I want to thank you all for all the wonderful comments and the perspectives, um, very important um, areas and, and challenges. But one area that I haven't heard much discussion around is adolescents and young adults and the role of, of the need to try to address NCDs in this context. I mean, when we think about Best Buys as an example, doing a lot with prevention and early intervention with just a few dollars. I think that addressing the needs of adolescents and young adults age 15 to 25 would be a very important uh, area, um, having a big impact on obesity, um, tobacco use, and a lack of physical activity, all as precursors to uh, the major non-communicable diseases. So I'm hoping that you can make some comments about opportunities um, to intervene for our uh, young citizens as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right next to Michelle. Thank you very much for a lovely presentation. My name is Manuel Harrison. I'm with Project 216. Um, I had a Fulbright in Georgia, and uh, the focus of my work being there was to develop the cancer control policy for, therefore I brought all this multi-sector, you name it, together to draft that. And it was coinciding with the UN 2011 September on NCD, therefore I became um, contributor and editor of their NCD. So I easily can say, working in that region with the folks, that they're very heavy, everybody has been very heavy with the influence of WHO, uh, to actually regulate uh, or perhaps just sign the policies. That's what I want to say. So signing the policy and then taking it to application, reg legislation, and implementation is where we actually do not have the capacity in those um, underdeveloped or developing countries. There is no institutional capacity or human capacity to deliver any part of that, from advocacy to prevention, name it. My office was in the Cancer Prevention Center where the doctors and patients simultaneously smoke. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, let's pause for a moment. Um, Lois put, uh, posed the question around, what are the examples of building off existing platforms? where the case studies of being able to do more with less and extend into the NCD range. Carolyn pointed us to the question around the people part and the innovations, radio, TV campaigns. Michelle's looking at adolescence. And Ms. Harrison posing this question about how do you address these gaps in policies. Jeff, you want to uh, uh, speak to a few of those? And then sure. we'll, turn, we'll open it up for, for you guys to jump in on which, which piece of this you want to comment on. Sure. I, um, let me just um, make a comment on Lois's, uh, Lois's question. I, first of all, the, uh, you know, the chapter on primary care does have some, uh, some other examples of where this kind of integration is working, and, uh, and it, you know, I think you'll find those useful, and the references point to some other uh, examples that are there in the literature. 
I actually think, and you know, uh, this is just my own opinion, but I think that PEPFAR is the best example we have of how um, integration is actually enabling uh, the program to get more health for the money and to do more with less. I, you know, um, you know, many of you are, are familiar with this, but I, uh, I was speaking with Eric Goosby just before he um, stepped down to return to California. And if I remember the number correctly, and you know, Steve or others will correct me, but I think that in the last four years, uh, they've tripled the number of people on antiretroviral treatment, and the budget has been flat. So that is a pretty powerful statement about uh, how you can get more uh, with less just by attending to the efficiency of how you deliver care and treatment, uh, and also to make sure that you just get rid of uh, duplication of effort and, uh, and you know, really do the best you can with the materials, uh, the resources that you have. Now, when you then expand that, and also part of what PEPFAR has done, in addition to getting more people on antiretroviral treatment, there are also tens of millions of people who are getting access to maternal and child health, to, um, uh, to breast cancer and cervical cancer uh, screening, uh, and they're also looking at integrating uh, other NCD interventions onto the PEPFAR platform in different countries. So, so I think that's you know, the, the biggest and best example we have of how this can work. Um, and the reason that it's so powerful is, uh, if you just think about it for a minute, um, you know, to the uh, other comment you, um, uh, Ms. Harrison was making about uh, Georgia, um, you know, yes, uh, as in many other uh, lower and middle income countries, there's a lack of institutional and human capacity. But part of the problem is that you'll have a cancer center here, you'll have uh, a center that looks at maternal health here, you'll have, you know, it's just all uh, siloed kinds of interventions. Uh, and in each of those centers, you'll have investments in a variety of, of drugs, of equipment, of, uh, you know, training facilities and uh, clinic facilities, which could be used to provide care in other, uh, other um, priority areas as well. And that's why um, figuring out a way to um, in integrate planning, to integrate the use of resources, to integrate from the perspective of the patient, because after all, patients don't present with just one condition. They have, uh, often have multiple conditions. Uh, to figure out a way to do this so that it makes sense from the patient point of view and also the best use of the resources seems to me, uh, Steve was asking, what's the next 10 years in global health going to look like? I think this is going to be a major focus over the next 10 years because the only way that countries will begin to approach what they hope to do with universal health coverage is to make the best use of available resources, because Sally's absolutely right. Um, I think there's a, a vanishingly small chance that we're going to see another global fund for NCDs, so we have to make the best use of the resources that we can mobilize. Uh, and so I think that this is really going to be a, the, the key set of technical and uh, issues at the, at the core of, of the move to universal health coverage. Luke, uh, of those four issues that were put on the table, can you harvest some nuggets out of the yes. volume to point us to? Yes. Uh, well, out of both personal experience, I, I am the oldest single working parent with two teenage daughters that you have probably ever met. And uh, I want to comment on adolescence. Uh, uh, I have a lot of experience with that. And uh, uh, you have to go through the schools. That's the uh, most cost-effective way. You have to get people at school age, and it has to be done through teachers who care. And uh, uh, that's much more effective than radio. They don't listen to your radio programs. They listen to theirs. And uh, uh, TV, they watch, but they uh, have cleverly learned how to get rid of the commercials. Uh, and so uh, uh, that's my observation on adolescence. Uh, uh, about... Um, cancer control and about the problem of unit capacity. I think that's a tremendous issue, and Jeff's touched on this. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm more, a little more optimistic about that, and I'm a little more optimistic about money, um, uh, but uh, uh, I think you get spillovers from all of these programs. Uh, spillovers, uh, uh, you get spillovers from clinical testing, and uh, I think those are extremely important. They're hard to measure. Uh, but I think if you look at what's happening on the ground, uh, that's what you see. So, so I think that that's going to be probably more effective in a certain sense than, than some kind of major rationalization of, of a program. Uh, I think that a lot of these programs where there, where there is 
uh, a breakdown in communication between parts of the of the of the treatment program. Um, uh, I think that that's a major problem, but I think it's really hard to rationalize these in part because you change everyone's job. Right. Sally, um, thanks, Steve. Just um, two comments quickly uh, about adolescence uh, uh, to Michelle's question. I, I think the cost effective things that you can do are adding HPV vaccine for both g girls and boys, especially for girls. And now um, some data out this week um, shows that as little as one dose rather than the three dose regimen may be effective. Uh, the, the price for Gavi eligible countries is now down to five dollars um, per dose. So even at three doses that may be um, affordable. In non-GABI countries, certainly in this hemisphere, through a very innovative PAHO, Pan American Health Organization, um, negotiation with the drug companies, I think the price is $13 per dose. Um, Mexico has already reduced it from the regimen from three doses to two doses. So I think it's becoming, um, again, pol political will being extremely important. We've seen that in even Texas and other places. I mean, you have to want to do it, but then I think the resources are there to do that. And male circumcision, which we know has a huge impact on HIV, also has an impact on HPV. So I think those are two um, relatively low cost interventions um, for adolescents that would make um, a big difference. The other thing I would say is how important it is to have correct data. I mean, one of the things we learned in the HIV epidemic at the beginning, and I was with UNAIDS, was that everybody had their own data. Countries had data, Harvard had data, WHO had data, uh, UNAIDS created their own data, and nobody could agree on, on the data. It was, it, it was an important point for advocacy and for fundraising to get some agreement on the data. So I think uh, to the point about cancer control and cancer registries, I know that for cancer, I assume it's true for other NCDs, Terrifically important to know um, what you're looking at, what your population is facing, to begin to design cost-effective interventions, to to really take advantage of of those best buys that you may have available to you. And I'll Thank jump you. perhaps on two of the questions if you don't yeah. mind, Steve. Just uh, so first of all, to compliment MCC on their leadership and apparently for your leadership, um, who would have ever thought that that leadership would have played itself out and far away Ulaanbaatar, but there we are. And, and you guys have done a great job. I'm sorry you're wrapping it up, and hopefully there'll be more. But I mean, tying at the core of it, the issue of, um, and I think, Sally, you hit on this, I think it, there's a lot more discussion, and we'll be having a discussion on the Hill next week, specifically on this topic of tying this whole discussion to growth, and how NCDs uh, actually tie into growth. Now, we know that health to wealth or health to growth is, is not an always easy argument to make, but I, I also know not enough thought has been put into it, and, and I think that's very, very important. But you didn't ask that question. You asked the question about what message is the most important, and I would say two, employer to employee and peer to peer. And what I mean, and, and people don't think about this, but if you think about you know, our um, employment uh, problems here in the United States, 7%, 8%, that means that a lot of other people are employed. And guess what? They're listening to their bosses. And organizations are creating great incentives. And if you're not hearing messages and actually getting incentives, like Discovery, the Vitality Group covers, covers under Discovery, to actually get uh, you know, healthy food, uh, or we, you know, I got an email from my uh, folks today, uh, fill out this health questionnaire and you'll get, you know, I don't know, $100 off on your you know, health insurance this year. Uh, those are all good things. And I think that's a very powerful medium because uh, there's a perception issue that just doesn't want to go away, and, it, and they keep on emailing it to you until you relent. Peer to peer, I don't think I have to uh, talk to more, but I think th that's a very, very, and, and, and uh, even if you, you know, poo-poo some of the efforts that the private sector is making, I think you would understand that that's a very important channel. I don't care if you're a government employer, you're a private sector employer, NGO employer, I don't care who you are. I mean, that's going to be a very important channel. And Michelle, I want to come down and hug you for that question uh, from Jopaigo, because uh, a colleague of mine from our philanthropy and myself uh, were the people that really were kind of the movers behind a specific project. Jeff Mears here, the co-chair, uh, together with my colleague Jeff, Justin Custer of the NCD Roundtable. But you were directly involved in something that we helped to start called NCD Child. Um, and you know, I can tell you how many discussions I've had with UNICEF over the years about this discussion. You know, you wouldn't want to 
you need a calculator, let's just put it that way. And it is so commonsensical. If we're going to talk about prevention, what is more commonsensical than talking to kids about the right things? And what is more important than the, the mother to child or father to child communication pattern when it comes to this? Let's use common sense. We don't need to start with you know, advanced medical technology. We need to start with good common sense. The NCD Child, I think we're largely the lone funder of that, and led by a, a visionary woman down under by the name of Dr. Kate Armstrong. And Jeff, you're on that. And UNICEF is actually on the board, thankfully. And I think it's their window into this discussion. I don't think you can get any better marketing vehicle than UNICEF uh, in the world. And we're very proud to be associated with it. But we need help. We need people that are actually interested in, in this activity. NCDchild.org, OK? And, and we need other companies, organizations of all shapes and sizes to be active, educate on this effort, and, and active on this effort. And, and it, so the exact products are facts for life, right? It could be a global publication that's going to talk about some of those commonsensical things that we consider common sense, but may simply not be common sense in other parts of the world. Those are very important. There are a lot of other very practical things that have come out of it. Some have already been produced, and, and you know, uh, we need all in on this one. Um, so thank you for that question. Thank you. Um, we uh, down in front here. If we could have, why don't we take, we'll collect some comments over in this quadrant. Yes, please identify uh, yourself. Crystal Lander, Management Sciences for Health. And I have two quick questions, both ho I hope are challenging. The first one is, we talked about PPPPs. I love that, Sally. Um, question is, other than tobacco, what industry would you not want to partner with on NCDs? And then the second one is related to um, PEPFAR. I, I was in DC when we worked on PEPFAR 1 and 2. Um, it was not easy, but PEPFAR 1 had very clear goals. What do we want to accomplish? As PEPFAR goes into its phase two, or really phase three, it's looking at what do we want to accomplish now? Things have changed a lot. So the question I'm asked on the Hill often is, what do you want to accomplish with NCDs? And for us, that's challenging. It's a lot of things that fall into it, but it's something that we clearly need to answer. So what, is, what do we want to accomplish? What would success look like? Thank you. And here we had a question here, hand up right here, and then over here. Thank you. My name is Amit Chandra. I sit on the board of the African Federation of Emergency Medicine. Uh, and my question to the panel is how you see acute care services and pre-hospital care fit into this discussion. And on a related note, how you see um, injury prevention and the issue of road trauma specifically fit into the non-communicable diseases debate. Thank you. Thank you. Right here. And then Keith Hi. behind you. My name is Laurent Hubert with the uh, Framework Convention Alliance. And uh, almost over 10 years after adoption of the FCTC and almost nine years after its entry into force, implementation is fairly low. And some people argue that if we were able to, and, and also even at country level, there's a lot of uh, incoherent positions, like the Czech Republic, for example, on one side ratifies the FCTC, adopts a tobacco bill. On the other side, it's in, involved in, um, in a trade challenge against uh, Australia uh, in support of Philip Morris. So some people are arguing that integrating NCDs and tobacco control in the post-2015 development agenda could help uh, create more coherence at national level. So I would be curious about what um, type of indicators would you think are uh, appropriate in the post-2015 development agenda as an under, an under whether it would be universal uh, health coverage or extended life expectancy overarching goal and what type of NCD target and then indicators would you like to see under that? That was one question. And the other one is about tax and fiscal policies, which have been identified as best buy, but also could be a source of uh, resources for implementation of NCD policies at country level. Thank you. Steve, right behind you. Uh, thank you very much for your timely presentation, and Steve, for organizing this, uh, this get-together. Um, we know what to do to deal with these challenges. We have a mountain of evidence, whether it's economic or others, to know what to do to address NCDs. So my question is, what are the obstacles and how do we overcome the mainstreaming of public health into primary care plus? And the plus being access to basic surgical care, which will deal with the issues you're, sir, you're talking about, the issues of help to address maternal health and to address the disability tsunami that's going to hit us as part of the NCDs. So the obstacles and how to overcome them. Thank you. Okay. Now, let's take one more right here. Okay. And then we'll, we'll come. We have time for at least one more round here. Yes, please. 
Yeah, thanks, and thanks for this stunning panel. I'm, I'm learning a lot right now. I'm from FHI 360, I'm Rebecca Benton. I'm working in health communication. And my question is um, to Sally and others, um, what have we learned in this area from the HIV epidemic for NCDs? Because one of the biggest mistakes we've made is to inv individualize risk and not look at social, cultural context and economic context of behaviors. And what um, is planned to be done differently for NCDs in this area? Um, who would like to jump in on this? Well, I have one suggestion. Actually, it, uh, it relates both to uh, this question and the one uh, that raised a couple of other issues around, um, you know, like road, uh, road accidents, which, uh, you know, in some countries, in Africa at least, are the, uh, the largest killer of children under five. So it's, and, and you're right, it, it often isn't uh, mentioned in, in discussions around NCDs. I think one of the things that we learned from uh, the HIV epidemic, and Sally uh, may want to jump in here as well, is um, we really began to make some progress in a more systematic way um, after the money had been raised, so you went from the millions to the billions. But then I think that uh, when the three ones were introduced, um, along with the mantra to know your epidemic, um, I think that that really helped to ensure that countries were able to take a, a systematic look at the issues that they faced. Uh, and that helped in allocating resources so that you could really make uh, progress on getting more health for the money. So, uh, and the three ones, uh, some, some of you will recall, were to have one national plan for how to deal with the epidemic, uh, one um, national agency to coordinate all the efforts, uh, and one monitoring and evaluation framework. So this gets back to the point that Sally ma mentioned about you can't do this if everyone has his or her own data. You, you know, you have to have one common framework. And that applies as well to NCDs. Now, many of the countries um, in, in lower and middle income countries are developing their NCD plans. That was part of the work that was um, uh, put in motion by, uh, by the WHA when they uh, adopted um, the, uh, the Global Action Plan. Uh, and so in the course of doing that, I think that you know, the question of how you can coordinate uh, acute care with chronic care, how you, um, how you deal with, um, with mental health issues, with road accidents, with injuries, as well as the NCDs that we've been talking about today, um, you know, how, whether you deal with uh, the elderly population, with kids, uh, um, you know, or, uh, or with adolescents, all of that's going to look different on a country-by-country -country basis. You can't make any categorical statements um, uh, that will actually help people deal with the issues in front of them. So I think um, that that insight from, uh, from the success in the, the latter stages of uh, the global response to the HIV epidemic uh, is going to be important over the next couple of years for dealing effectively with NCDs at the country level. Thank you. I don't really have much to add. I, I, I think I, I would say that it, it is really important to integrate things and to get patient empowerment for dealing with a, a lot of these things. I, I mean, one of the things I think the American Cancer Society does very successfully, and I think um, probably other groups as well, is sort of help patients with navigation, just help you know whether you come in through acute care or however you come into the medical system, how to navigate that, how to get the services that you, you need. I think that's, that's going to be um, important as we go forward. Uh, industry I'll questions. answer your question. I mean, there were two sort of related questions. Our colleague, uh, our medical colleague here, and also the, our colleague over here, Keith, I think, I heard the first name, but I didn't understand your organization, by the way. Oh, CUJH, okay, very good. That makes a lot of sense, all right. So, yeah, so, so it's a, it's a, it's, I think they're sort of tied. And let me give you a medical technology perspective, but hopefully that's relevant to, to public health. I mean, you know, at, at the, certainly, so if you look at our philanthropic commitment that we've announced, uh, our new sort of $16 million commitment, it's very focused on uh, building up frontline health workers, very much uh, health systems perspective trying to build up that, 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 that front end. And that's particularly necessary in emerging economies. But certainly, uh, I think a lot of companies, a lot of organizations, my colleague uh, is here from GE Healthcare, Marianne Ring, there's a lot of other companies that are here, and also public and private sector actors, universities all working together are building out the you know, secondary care, tertiary care. Um, we as a medical technology company, you know, we know a little bit about uh, exactly the incidents that you're talking about. Manufacturing 71,000 technologies gives you that right to talk about that. Um, but we know that we need to change our business models. We've got a, so, so thankfully, in, at least in our company, we've got a Bangladeshi CEO that very much is concerned about exactly the problems that you're talking about. 
So you've got to change your business models. You've got to make technologies that are simply more relevant. We've just announced two weeks ago uh, uh, the, the, a, a kidney dialysis version of what GE Healthcare did relative to ultrasound, but doing it for kidney dialysis, a portable kidney dialysis unit, which could be put up in your overhead airplane hanger. Uh, that is, instead of 300 liters of water, it's going to take three. Those type of things that happen in India and other such fine places in the world. Uh, you've got to change the technology landscape. We're, in, we're well in advance in, in trying to do that, but we're still in the early stages of the game. Um, and it goes on and on. So I'd say that a lot of things have got to change in the public health arena, and that is just the, the absolute resolute lack of uh, doctor capacity. Forget about surgical teams. You know it well. We're talking about just resolute lack of doctor capacity at secondary and tertiary healthcare levels in vast majorities of countries. And we think that uh, those, those investments are also necessary. We're going to be a partner in making those investments along with the public sector. Uh, let governments themselves decide which direction to go. Certainly in Africa, a tremendous amount of the healthcare is already being de delivered by the private sector, so that's not an intellectual debate for them. Um, you know, wherever the best care is got, um, you don't simply have to jump on the next uh, BA flight to go to London uh, to have that done. It should be done locally, um, and you should have that operation with your family in present, <laughs> as opposed to uh, at great distance uh, when these type of things happen. Lou, you have a comment? Uh, I think what cuts through all the questions is how do you get a movement started? And I think w my own view historically is that you're right now at the point where the highly generalized discussions, the, the affirmation of the need has taken place at the international level. And you're now moving into a period when, as this book did, we hope, was things get much more specific and you look for solutions in part of the world, not the entire world, uh, and it seems to me you also look for the resources in the same way. You look for success, then you're looking for some success stories that sustain uh, resources. Uh, people don't like to give money if you talk to a development officer. People don't like to give money because you're in distress. They like to give money because you're succeeding. And so those, I think, will come out, uh, and that was one of the important um, uh, results, I think, of the of the uh, Gates and, and Merck combination in Botswana was to give a demonstration of what could work. And, and I think that, that that's going to happen, that's, that we're right now at that phase. And, and so that's, I think, the way we see the book. Um, down in front here is a, a, a person um, who would like to, do you have a microphone? Um, we do you have a microphone? Uh, Jeff has been patient. No, let's get a microphone. Jeff's been patiently, and then here, and Sam, and we'll, we'll come. So, yes. Okay, thank you. Stop talking and start doing. I appreciate your comment, Sally. My name is Kelly Buchanan-Galb. I'm director of operations at a company called Anywhere. We are working to bring medical instrument sterilization to the developing world that is portable and power-free, addressing treatment of NCDs through central surgery. My question is, what kind of advice could you give to a company in product development phase who is willing and already talking and collaborating with both ministries of health in Africa and co-designing with patients? Um, Jeff, and then uh, in front here, and we'll come to you, Sam, in a moment. Just a second, yes. Thanks. Uh, Jeff Muir, the Public much. Health Institute. Congratulations on a great panel. Um, a little commercial, uh, which Trevor already preempted, but Justin Kester from Medtronic and I co-chair a group called the NCD Roundtable that meets in Washington once a month. For many of you are members of this roundtable. It's very focused. It's dedicated to Washington, D.C.-based advocacy. Sally, we will welcome your participation now that you're at ACS. So if you have questions about this, you can go to our website, uh, ncdroundtable.org, or see one of us after the meeting. My question is, we talked about a bunch of donors today. We talked about the private sector. We talked about philanthropy. We talked about governments. We didn't talk about international financial institutions. And I'm wondering if anybody on the, on the dais would care to comment on the role. Sally, you touched on it a little bit with PAHO, but 
it's broader than that. It's the bank, it's all the IFIs, and they are not lacking in funding. So would love to hear your perspectives on that. Thank you. Uh, so we have one question from Ariella through Twitter. How slash where do your recommendations converge or diverge from the current post-2015 discussions? Hello, I'm Elizabeth Ransom, and um, I just finished five years with University Research Company, International Health Company. I'm going to be starting work with the U.S. government public health initiative next week, pending my security clearance. And I'm, I want to thank you for an excellent panel and a wonderful discussion. Um, I don't know. Okay. Um, so, Mike, one of my questions is, I noticed that no one mentioned the serendipitous timing of today's panel, and I wonder if anyone knows what public health issue is highlighted today. It's World Diabetes Day. World Diabetes Day, Day that's yeah. right. And um, I wanted to mention it because it's the day that Charles Banting uh, invented insulin. And for me, this is a very important day because without insulin, I would not be alive. And so I'm between jobs, so I'm here as the, the P, the fourth P in the model that Sally mentioned. Um, so the other question my professional had is I'm a communicator. And I'm wondering about the name. I've been so excited about this, this NCD movement, but non-communicable diseases. It says what you're not, but not what you are. And I'm wondering if you might consider re-looking at the nomenclature. Thank you. Can you just hand that to Sam here? Um, <coughs> Samuel Denny Jones. I, if you can forgive oh, you me, oh, I'm sorry. I have a... I'm sorry. <coughs> I, I don't know, Trevor might remember that when you had a, a meeting about two years ago, I asked the, the same question. Uh, and the issue, you said that there might not be a global fund for NCD. What if there was, what would you actually use the money to do? And that is a difficult uh, question. And at that time, I think, at that time it was posed differently. The lesson I learned from HIV AIDS and from uh, malaria as well, uh, was that the money came, but by the time the money came, there was a clear consensus, evidence-based consensus, on what a package of activities you could put together and what outcome you would get. I mean, if you remember, HIV PEPFAR was called 2710. It was very clear that you, know, you had to treat um, uh, 2 million people, about 7 million infections, and care for 10 million. The outcomes were very clear, and how to get to those outcomes were clear. Do we have a clear set of activities, not broad consensus, not broad framework on what these activities could be that you could put together so that a donor would say, look, I, I, I'm not willing to fund concepts and frameworks, but I, I can fund activities that would lead to these outcomes and hold you to those outcomes. You're gonna set off a very interesting fight. <laughs> Hi, uh, Lee Yerkes, I'm retired. Uh, sorry I was late, and I, I apologize if these two points were covered. I was involved in the initial procurement of uh, U.S. government funded uh, for antiretrovirals pre-PEPFAR uh, in three test countries, Ghana, Rwanda, and Kenya, and fortunately that was successful and PEPFAR resulted from that. But I uh, was very interested to hear Jeff's comment about the, the, and I'm not surprised that the number of patients on therapy supported by PEPFAR has tripled with no increase in funding. Because I know the, the cost of uh, treatment has come down significantly. But my, I have two very quick questions. Number one, what has been the impact of the successful HIV AIDS treatment programs on the advent of NCDs among that population and number two, has there been a look, have we looked at integrating the diagnosis and treatment of NCDs in that target population and at those very successful treatment sites? Thank you. I'd like to suggest, we'll come back, I think we'll have time for another round. Uh, what I'd like to suggest is we start at Sally and just work our way down here. Okay. Sally, would you like to, and just pick off whichever pieces of these uh, multiple questions you care to you care to address? They're, they're all really good questions, and I feel like we could be here um, all night, which, which would be um, great. Um, <laughs> um, I think, you know, the, 
certainly in the HIV AIDS epidemic, the, the international financial institutions began to play a big role. And, and if you look back at the World Bank already put out a paper in 2011, I mean, my, my feeling about all of these things is that they're political institutions as well. Um, they're not just run by their management, they're run by their boards. Their boards are the people who represent the US government and the UK government and all of the other governments who are donors to them. I also have a career in the U.S. government, and I know that there isn't necessarily unanimity among U.S. government institutions, so I think somebody has to be really pushing on the U.S. executive director to the World Bank and to the Inter-American Development Bank and all the rest of these things. But it's like turning around Queen Mary's. It takes a long time. It took a long time. Um, if between when it was beginning to be recognized that there was an out-of-control HIV epidemic going on in sub-Saharan Africa and when the funding really flowed. So I agree with Lou. I think we're, so, we're somewhere in the development of that, and it's actually history repeats itself, you know, as tragedy and farce, but I'm hoping that um, we will have learned that delay doesn't serve anybody and we need to work on it faster. To the, to the question about... Um, sterilization and being able to do that, I think it's terrifically important. I mean, surgery is going to be, um, and we look at all the low-hanging fruit, and that's certainly prevention is a low-hanging fruit. Some of the things that don't need surgery seem easier to do, but I think certainly in, in, in cancer, um, we need to have surgery, and I think that can't be sustainably done by um, five doctors from Harvard flying in for a week and feeling good about it and then leaving. I mean, we have to be able to transfer those skills, and the skills are not only the skills to do the surgery, but the skills are how to maintain the environment in which that can be done sustainably. But I think every country will need some tertiary facilities to be able to handle um, these kinds of things. So... Um, you know, I'll, I'll leave it there. I mean, on diabetes treatment, I, I uh, had forgotten that today was World Diabetes Day and how important insulin is to that. But we also know that insulin, the price of insulin varies so incredibly widely throughout the world. To get some conversation going and also the kind of how will we get diabetes treatment insulin out to people who need it? Is that a a kit where you can buy at a fairly low cost both the syringe and the insulin um, and, and package it the way we've been able to package some of these other things. That's part of what the book talks about, but I think insulin is going to be extremely important to facing that. Thank you. Lou, would you care to speak well, to some I think, of the issues? Yes, just uh, very quickly, um, I, I, I think that uh, integration of activities uh, is going to be extremely important uh, in, in this, what I see as this first phase. And, and we are just at the point where we're trying to make things specific and where specific experiments are, or attempts are going to be made. So I think that uh, if that works at the primary level, that the effects will come up, it seems to me, to the secondary, to what in the British system is the secondary level and maybe to the third level ultimately, uh, that's going to involve changes in education in other, in other countries. And these are going to be relatively expensive. Again, the model of, that's talked about in the book about supply chain uh, integration and about integration or harmonization of regulation is going to be one of the factors that's going to make that possible because every country is not going to be able to train all of the doctors, all of the nurse practitioners and all of the technicians that they need. So uh, I, I think that the movement that started in this way is going to force change along those lines. Thank you. Um, we had Elizabeth ask about the name. Our web person asked about how does this all fit in the post-2015 agenda. Sure. I, um, one reason, Elizabeth, when you asked this question about can't we call non-communicable diseases, diseases something else, yeah is that everybody who's been advocating around this for the last several years has wished they had a better answer to that, that question. So, so if anyone has any bright ideas, I'm sure we'd all like to have a, a different name than non-communicable diseases that were actually for something. So, but um, let me just comment quickly on, on a couple of these, uh, these very good questions. Um, you know, Kelly asked a question, what can we offer, what advice can we offer to a small company that's uh, trying to start up in this area? 
And I think actually the, um, the question that was posed about international financial institutions by Jeff is part of that answer. Uh, just to give you one example, I mean, first of all, the World Bank and the other IFIs are, you know, massive institutions with a whole range of issues that they're working on. Um, I think that the timing right now, given Jim Kim's um, new strategic direction for the World Bank to end extreme poverty uh, and also to address poverty in uh, middle-income countries as well as in the lowest-income countries, um, and given Jim Kim's background uh, in trying to reconfigure global health himself for, uh, you know, before he went to the World Bank, I think that uh, it's an interesting juncture for trying to encourage the bank to take a look at how to integrate um, health into more of the work they do. And through the IFC, um, you know, they created an Africa Health Fund a couple of years ago along with other, uh, other donors. And I remember in talking to the people who were responsible for that, uh, what worried them was that they'd put this money out there, several hundred million dollars, to try to um, help small and medium enterprises do more for health in lower and middle income countries, and they just couldn't find any projects to invest in. So there's an opportunity for you, uh, is to see uh, whether you can pers persuade them that they should invest in your, your project. And, and then on, uh, on uh, because it's World Diabetes Day, I just want to um, make a comment about that. You know, right now there are more than 370 million people around the world who are living with diabetes, and uh, that uh, disease is growing at a, an alarming rate. Um, you know, the, um, the International Diabetes Federation just issued its latest diabetes atlas, uh, and it shows, I forget the precise number, but it's going to be close to 600 million people in the next uh, 10 or 15 years if something isn't, uh, you know, if we don't change the trend right now. Um, and one of the things uh, that's critical in understanding uh, the nature of the diabetes epidemic today is that in many cases, um, uh, in, depending on which country you take, most people who have diabetes don't know they have diabetes. Um, you know, and this is not dissimilar to what we've seen in other disease uh, conditions in the past, but, uh, but a lot of what uh, government can do uh, is to work on the prevention side. I mean, if you, the earlier you intervene, the less it costs, uh, just as a general principle. So if we can just find ways to mobilize um, uh, individuals and communities and, uh, and patient groups and others to just get the word out to people, here are the things to look for, here are the risk factors, um, you know, here are uh, places you can go to get advice if you think you might be ill, that actually is the first step on a path toward really finding a much more effective way to deal with more of these conditions. And then that relates to the last thing I'll comment on, uh, the post-2015 discussions about where should health fit in the, in the new set of sustainable development goals. Um, and I think that, you know, the kinds of things we've been talking about today and that we address in this book um, have to do with, you know, the, the debate around universal health coverage, which has been at the core of this, um, uh, the discussions around uh, what should the next set of sustainable development goals look like, have really dealt with questions about who should be covered, what should be covered, how much of that should be covered. Uh, but ultimately, governments and their partners are going to have to get down to the question of how do we actually do the things that we've decided should be covered under universal health care. Uh, and so um, I think that it's the kind of pragmatic suggestions that we've been talking about. How can you improve regulatory environments? How can you do better jobs, uh, uh, a better job on supply chains? How can you actually get primary care to cover more of the health conditions that affect people at that level? Um, those are all going to be relevant to really uh, implementing the decisions that may be made around universal health coverage as a new sustainable development goal. So I'll hit one, two, three, actually. I'll start with our colleague over there because you sort of asked a, I call it a pre-commercial question, uh, which is that, you know, what do you do with a new innovative, you're in a new innovative technology space and, you know, I mean, though, though we are the largest in, the, in, in our sector, the fact of the matter is 85% of the companies are small, medium-sized companies. The, a doctor has a great idea, they decide to perfect the idea. It's not starting with the lab scientist. So it's great. It's, it's very clinically inspired who then turned to an engineer, and, and we're very interested in those discussions. I think one of the parts that's actually been missed here is the fact that the, the finest innovations in, in to change this landscape, and by the way, to re-import into the United States, Samuel, you know, into the United States are ones that actually started well overseas in very resource poor economies. We're actually, that venture I talked to on kidneys is with Apollo. It is a private sector, largest private sector player in India, get the point. But still, I mean, that's a type of uh, inspiring activity. We'd love to talk to you more about that. And I think that we need to inspire solutions that we can re-import into the United States. We've got a slight problem in, in terms of percentage to GDP that we're spending on healthcare. Uh, uh, I think that might be a secret, but I'm not so sure. Um, 
multilateral development banks, Jeff, uh, you know, I, I was a big critic um, of multilateral development banks until the high-level meeting, and we track some of us very closely. And here's my conflict of interest statement. We could actually commercially benefit from following those, and, and I'm declaring that out front. And I tell you, we actually follow those. We actually make, make money on those projects, okay? So just so you know that, okay? Conflict of interest in, in statement finished. Um, I would say that uh, you have a remarkable amount of leadership actually coming out right now uh, from a different institutions. Islamic Development Bank, people don't think very much of. Uh, World Bank certainly, well, I got a very interesting email from some, from some very high level people at a very large IFI recently people that I've been trying to engage for three years when we put our new commitment on the street, the philanthropy commitment on the street, and that was really helpful. But I think what you, you know, uh, look in an obvious ways. Look at unilateral donors like Luxembourg. Our friends in Luxembourg have done some very, very important things, and let's look at them. But also look at the other UN institutions that actually have been tremendously responsive. And I mean uh, UN Family Plan Planning Agency, UNFPA. It's tied to the mother, child. Great leadership coming out of UNFPA. I got a solicitation the other day from UNHCR. They're talking about refugees and, and NCD education around UNHCR. It is a public solicitation, not top secret. Um, uh, Helen Clark, head of UNDP of all things, is almost risking her presidency, or, I'm sorry, executive directorship on, the U, uh, on this discussion. I mean, let's be proud of those and let's celebrate those rather than necessarily uh, you know, talking about those that perhaps are less responsive, I think they'll come, and, and if not Margaret Chan will, will track them down and find them, and if not Ban Ki-moon will find them. Um, I, to Ariella, I, I think on the 2015 discussion, post-2015 discussion, certainly think it's very important. I think she was asking about the consistency point between us and perhaps with our external. I, look, I think, I think to say the obvious, we've got a report on the street, which is a high-level eminent person's report. Please read it. Um, because it does have three references there um, to NCDs, and that's a lot, I, I was told by Homi Hamras. And so that gives uh, some confidence that it's certainly in play. Exactly the how, and Jeff was talking about that to a certain extent, uh, are, are very important. Um, but I do, you know, yesterday was opened up, I think, a global, the largest ever global survey um, uh, trying to solicit worldwide feedback on those MD post-2015 2015 goals, so participate as well. Uh, thousands have already done so in the context of this high-level uh, person's report. Uh, let's just make it right. Whatever form it takes, let's be participant. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I apologize to some of our uh, listeners who are patiently waiting to pose questions. We've, we're running out of time. I apologize. Uh, perhaps you can engage some of our speakers after this. Um, I want to close by, first of all, thanking uh, my colleagues, Matt Fisher, uh, Jessica Alpert, who did a very good close read of the book earlier, um, uh, Alicia Kramer, Lindsay Hammergren, who've uh, put a lot of time into making this event happen. I want to thank Raven Martin, Tina Flores, who's uh, uh, Jeff's colleague, who's done a terrific job in preparing this and thinking this through. Um, I want to congratulate the authors, the editors, the contributors um, to this volume. I think that You've really made a major contribution. It's, as, as Sally emphasized, this is pragma pragmatism as, at its best. You've offered us five points, no more than five key points. That's incredible discipline. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, if you'd gone to six, you would have lost me. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and you have a framework. It hangs together, and it's driven by optimism, and it's driven by an appeal for leadership and for sort of practicality and sensibility. And uh, I think a conversation is evolving. I think the conversation's evolving in very positive directions. And in, to significant degree, it's because of your leadership, uh, Jeff and, and um, Lou and Trevor and Sally and many of you that are here in this room who are really the, at the center of this movement. So uh, please join me in thanking our panelists and thank you. Thank you.